Ladies and gentlemen, dear organizers, dear colleagues, it is my pleasant obligation to thank the conveners of this event for having me here in Durham today. Um, in a nutshell, I will use my time to condensely present at this venue some of the results in one of the chapters of my doctoral thesis, which is due in autumn this year, probably in November, and I will most happily welcome you all to my defense, be it physically or in a hybrid form. Um, the starting point of my thesis is the long-standing historiographical debate about the identity of 46 individuals in the late 10th and early 11th centuries that got commemorated as Thanes in Danish and Swedish runic inscriptions. The debate has frequently relied on the fuller historical evidence here in England. As of now, no resolution has been found. And I make a point that this is because Thanes never were an object of study for their own sake. In turn, when resorting to Anglo-Saxon material, a comparison was similarly drawn not with first-hand sources, but with scholarly literature. In order to contribute and using the luxury of allotted book space, in my thesis, I decided to start from the bottom and before anything else, trace the trajectory of Anglo-Saxon Thanes starting from King Alfred's reign and ending at the Norman Conquest. It is these results, somewhat cockily titled Sociology of Anglo-Saxon Thanes, that I'll be sharing today. Two years ago at the Congress in Kalamazoo, I argued that, contrary to the just-mentioned scholarly literature, beginning this trajectory at the works of Archbishop Wollstone is rash. To briefly recapitulate my points that I since then even refined in my thesis, currently a manuscript only. First, Wollstone writing spotlight things rather late in the period and projecting them back, all the more far back, is not mythologically sound. Second and most importantly, Wollstone is known as a stout ideologist and legalist to the bone. Wollstone cherished an idea of what Patrick Wollstone called orderly society, and it is in this context that he wrote on the station of a thane. Furthermore, as evinced by Andrew Rabin not long ago, Wilson recycled the 7th century legislation rather freely. Third, whereas some thane outward features described by Wilson and that made a thane conspicuous in social landscape do find uh, further support, his thane sociology does not. I know I will sound unconventional, and I'll ask you to bear with me, and for the lack of time, I will be most happy to substantiate what I wrote on what I will, you'll see on the slide in the Q&A section. But, simply put, there's no pre wilson evidence that things universally enjoyed a 1200 shilling war guild. There is, in fact, evidence to the country, as we just heard. There's no evidence that the five height criterion ever worked as any promotion uh, promotion mechanism, mechanism that led to such a war guild. Um, for all we know, Wilson was recycling Ine 24 too. And there is no evidence a unified and strict thingly hierarchical pyramid of service ever existed. Now, I will not, uh, I will qualify the statement and I will say that this is not to claim that people never had 1200 shilling war guilds, nor is it to say that people didn't commend themselves and did not serve other lords. Of course, that would be preposterous. Um, I'm only saying that there is not enough evidence that they were referred to as Thanes. Um, to hedge my bets and not throw... Um, I actually leave this for now. To hedge my bets and not throw the baby with the bathwater, I do not dismiss Wilson's ex wholly, but I prefer to sidestep them as a point of departure in studying Thanes, although it would be preposterous to deny them any source value, of course. But if not Wollstone's noble rank, or to use a German concept, der Stand, what were things? Uh, since I'm not known for laconicism, instead of me, my girlfriend asked this question, Chad GPT, <laughs> and <laughs> the answer it gave upset me a little, because except for some details marked on the slide, um, the conclusion, uh, the, the definition it provided roughly matched what I had in my conclusions in my own chapter three. <laughs> so... <laughs> So why, why, why did I need to write 100 pages? Uh, what it did not explain is when this phenomenon came about and how. And how exactly did it happen that a word for servant came to mean a social status? Consider the word vassal. Um, in origin, guasus, it means the same thing, but it developed to mean a social relation between two individuals, not a social status, or not a social status per se, it may be derived from a relationship, but it's not a status in itself. 
But I will go even further and, uh, with a look back at the name of our conference, ask, was Thane even a historical ontology of a social status, rank, or office? At this point, we have to admit that social theory exists, and it is more than applicable to historical research. A historical ontology is a concept introduced by Ian Hacking and summarized in this slide in gray. For the sake of brevity, when I speak of things as historical ontology, I mean a certain social behavior that arises from people's self and external identification that are in a state of a constant feedback loop. And this behavior is directly tied in with the constituent social features. This is especially important since we don't actually work with living people, do we? We work with their representations in our sources, and these sources are written in a certain language, and we are not the target audience, or at least initially. Between a historical ontology, um, a concept, in, uh, I'm sorry, between a historical ontology, moreover, and a word that could describe it, there is also a concept in the mind of the contemporary. I will now stop scaring you with theory and just draw the line here by saying that a circulation of a word thane does not in itself mean there was a group of people that was somehow different from others, and that even if some contemporaries thought of this group as things, it does not in itself mean that this group always subscribed to it, or that if this was their uh, one and only definitive feature or social role. To save me some time and not scare you further off, I'll go straight and say that my corpus analysis of Old English persuaded me that a concept of a thane as a separate social phenomenon definitely existed. The when did it arise question has a surprisingly concrete answer. Sometime by the 980s at the earliest. This is when the word thane for the first time figures as a potential nominal element in a formula that would later look like an, uh, would look like this, an uh, approbatory adjective, good, best, or elder, plus a noun to denote a group of people, sometimes preceded by a qualification, many, other, or even very many other. Right away, it must be said that verbal realization of a concept of a social elite on this model is itself nothing special. It occurs in many places and languages in medieval Europe. Moreover, it is present in Old English from the moment our corpus begins en masse. This, in this table, I've summarized such formula that I've been able to find in the Toronto Corpus of Old English. But note when good things occur in the 990s. S1216 that I mentioned on the slide differs a little, but this is probably because the formula is still in its embryonic form. Also note when good things disappear shortly before the conquest, though other expressions carry on. Here's an even more daunting table, and I do apologize for the micro uh, typeset, but this was the only way to fit it on this slide, so I'll ask you to believe my honest word. <laughs> this table draws together the lexical expressions built around a syndetic formula elite and commoners, or both the elite and commoners. The table is perhaps less exhaustive, because you don't really always know what to look for in the corpus, and uh, furthermore, there is no comparable digital corpus of Anglo-Saxon Latin, and here I draw also the Latin examples as well. Um, but still, once, once more, apparently, such formula used to be common across early medieval Europe. In England, we've got the first uh, one attested already in King Ines' laws. But Thanes joined this formula again in the 990s. A lot of these data are pulled uh, from charters. But we should discover a very similar dynamics in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. There are 26 episodes in which Thanes figure across all reductions. In this sequence, there's a very pronounced change in how things are reported between the year 988 and 1067. Before and after, they are people in royal service. Further, before 988, a genitivus possessivus invariably precedes things, so they would be usually referred to as king's things, or his things, or her things, in case of Ethelflaed. And Thanes invariably engage in comitatus activities as warriors in personal capacities or as military leaders on king's behalf. The years 988 to 1067 stand out. In them, save one dubious annal for the year 1028, Thanes act independently of kings, sometimes against incumbent monarchs. And even if they get a lexical definition, it is done, it is done through a locality to which they belong, so things of, the, of Yorkshire or things in Devonshire, for example. If we take a step back from philology and activate our historian's mode and look at what people call things do, in charters, the chronicle and laws, both royal and not, but not Wollstone's non-royal 
uh, legislation, we will discover that they act as a local elite on various tiers. If I understand this expression correctly, they are what in modern English is called honorary freemen. Paul Vinogradov called them, uh, I quote, county families of later days, and Simon Keynes, the very fabric of social and political order. Uh, this is all nice and well, but how and why does the word Thane get on board the concept of an elite and starts referring to a corresponding historical ontology? There is no doubt that people under King's personal lordship from very early on, probably even before the migration, were referred to by kings themselves as king's thanes. From the 8th century, at the latest, such people became beneficiaries in royal land donations. In the 910s and 20s, the West Saxon king rapidly took over the southern Danelaw. The Winchester reduction of the chronicle uses a very specific language here. Um, the conquered, I quote, submit and yield to King Edward, but they also choose and seek him as lord and protector. And they also sometimes swear him oaths. A nice and clear dissection of political and personal commendation in this period is hardly possible. Uh, compare the Chronicle's words that, I quote, all the army in East Anglia swore, uh, swore agreement with King Edward that they would uh, agree to all that he would. And I compare it with the formula um, of an oath, um, a commendation oath that is presently known as Swearian. Um, in Swearian, the inferior party must choose the Lord's will. In all likelihood, Edward imposed on the Danelo elites the West Saxon type of relationships between king and his vassals and used a corresponding language to describe it. What is more, there's a non-zero chance that as part of this process, Danelo landed proprietors had their property rights confirmed by King Edgar, uh, sorry, King Edward. Um, from the famous litigation in Huntingdonshire after roughly 976, recorded in the Libellus of Waldi, we learn and can infer that whenever a territory in the Danelaw was being conquered, local landed proprietors were made a town and proverbial hard to refuse binding offer to become the king's vassals <laughs> and retain their landed property or else to forfeit landed status. The, la the Anglo Saxon Chronicle thus likely recorded this process. Um, whether or not this co-optation was backed by royal diplomas and therefore, quote-unquote, booklandization in a strict sense is a different matter altogether. But subjecting Danish lands to royal bookland claims went at least with some partial success because we know that kings could and very often confiscated booklands and in the same Libellus of Water, there's a very telling quote that uh, all land in Huntingdonshire essentially can be forfeited to the king. So my first conclusion thus boils down to the following. Thanes as a local elite is a product of an imposition of the royalist concept of West Saxon vassalage from the first quarter of the 10th century. But we do not see this word being used in such a quality for um, further leastwise half a century. Um, in the interest of time, I will admit that this may have been uh, what our sources tell us, and not via Sagendisch gewesen war, as uh, Hanke would have said, because I found few but still very important testimonies that in the royal discourses, this sense did appear several times in between those dates. To actually fasten the sense outside the royal discourse proper, it had to somehow uh, get disseminated. And I think there is a rather plausible mechanism and means that invite themselves, royal writs, although this is not the only way, it's just the way that we can be safely um, uh, confident of that it existed. Now, I sadly uh, have got no time to engage in the protracted debate on the dates and origins of royal writs, and I will have to ask you to once more and wholeheartedly believe my honest word when I say that I am familiar with it. Um, for my uh, intents and purposes, the writs as a fixed documentary form and material object are not as important per se. Rather, I make a case that even if such material objects can be safely dated to King Canute's reigns, uh, reign at the earliest, it is almost certain that their elements had circulated before, and perhaps long before. In particular, I look at the address formulae that universally read that thanes, uh, the kings greet such and such in a given shire and all his thanes. The opening phrase in Athelstan III, preserved only in a much later Latin, tempts me to read it as a, figuratively speaking, um, reversed greeting formula. You can see that there are very obvious parallels here, even though they're in different 
languages. Um, note, by the way, that this address suggests that tiny could be both common as and the elite, although a lot depends on whether the syntax here is conjunctive or disjunctive. This brings me to a second conclusion. Not only were things as a local elite a product of a royal ideology and language, but it also was kept alive and propagated by means of royal government. It is patently clear that the language of this government, at least in respect of things, was surprisingly uniform and formulaic, so that it probably didn't match the realities on land. For example, if we look at King Edward's uh, writs, we have them addressing people in Yorkshire, in Nottinghamshire, in uh, East Anglia, and in Devonshire, and uh, Wiltshire, and they all use the same language, regardless of what actually looked, what the social landscape actually looked at. So, so far, so good. We have established that the word thing proliferated in Old English. My count revealed about 2,000 plus entries in the Toronto corpus, and that a concept of a thane as a person from the elite did certainly exist by the end of the 10th century, when Wilson also picks it up and gives it a unique spin in his ideology. But what of ontology? In other words, was there something that made things a unique phenomenon, a putatively unique social entity that had to find a conceptual and lexical expression? And how do you answer this question? Well, here, Here's where I step uh, on the thinnest ice in my thesis and my today's presentation, I must admit. My suggestion is to try to combine the possible internal and external evidence on the identity of such a group. First, I will list the major arguments that um, support the idea that people call themselves things because they internalize this identity and that outside, uh, outsiders identify them as such for a reason. Of course, one immediately think of the ordinance concerning the Dunsate and its use of things in the elite versus commoners formula. Then naturally, they're already mentioned charters. They seem very straightforward, right? Of course, one must remember the famous Cambridge Guild Regulation that overtly presents itself as a code among some Cambridgeshire things, verbally. It's right there. Wollstone, well, yes, of course, I argued for caution in reading him, but it is unlikely that he ignored his reader's space of experience he probably defied their horizon of expectations, it is true, but he had to strike a chord with them. The same can be said about Elfric, who we know wrote for non-Latinate elite laity, um, as we heard yesterday, for example. It is possible that the language of the two, as well as other royalist authors, could have uh, been picked up by the audience. There's a very telling parallel between Elfric's rendition of the Latin phrase, uh, liter age, in, in Joshua 1.18, as huge thainliture, and a similar phrase, doth thainliture, in S1462, which postdates Elfric's text, so we might consider that there's a direct connection there. Uh, one should not underestimate the discourse introduced from above, of course. Then there's, of course, the Doomsday Book. Um, I counted almost a thousand times that the word Tainus uh, get, get used. And there's also the uh, De Epsisune Dunelme that uses a Latinized tame without any declination in reference to some important Northumbrians. All these arguments can be objected, um, however. Uh, for example, the first three here, they all suspect of royal uh, language. Um, Wilson and Elfric, well, they're not quantifiable, they're unique evidence. The Doomsday Book, I will probably discuss this in a Q&A or in the coffee break, it's woefully and systematic how it uses its language. The Epsisoni is also rather peculiar because there are many people uh, mentioned there, and those that we know that attended the court are not called uh, uh, things, although they are ministering the charters, and vice versa, those that didn't, that actually get called things. So, very inconsistent here. And then there's, of course, negative evidence, too. Wilhelm of Malmesbury elaborates on these on a terse account in the Northumbrian Rebellion in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of 1065, and supplies seven names of ministry, he writes in Latin, uh, five are identifiable, and only two have signed as ministry. But worse, their, relation, uh, their relationship seems a little upset in various accounts, so it's plausible that, in fact, it's two names uh, in multiple generations. There's a unique inscription on a porch in a church in uh, Kirkdale. It was commissioned by the founder of one Orm Sam of Gamal, um, probably one of, the, uh, one of this family. And here he did use the offices or titles of an earl and knut, uh, king, but he did not refer to himself as staying, even if he probably was a minister in at least one of the charters. So why that? Probably was not important. Wills, 
will the cell, we wills our ego documents and would find no example of people referring to themselves as I, X, Athane, even though we have the same for elder, Elderman, Reeves, and Kings, and Bishops, so nothing of the sort. Linguistics, uh, we have some terms that survive Middle English, like Earl, Elderman, Reeve. Uh, we also have new words that are coming in, like gentry and gentleman, but the Thane dies out. We have Knicht replacing it for all intents and purposes. The word Thane does survive, but it then dies out, and then it gets reintroduced uh, from Scots. So perhaps we need some caution in using uh, the word uh, Thane in our modern scholarship. Um, as Shakespeare said, a rose by another name would smell as sweet. I'm not saying that Thanes did not exist at all, but if we're using this as a blank term across the board, are we not per uh, per perpetuating, to figuratively speaking, um, a narrative of the kings, by the kings, and for the kings? Thank you very much.